Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, an internal medicine and rheumatology specialist. Today I'm here in Sault Ste. Marie doing a locum, taking care of patients in the hospital, and you're gonna join me for the day. Okay, step one is figuring out what patients I am seeing today, who came into the emergency department, and what is going on. Every morning is a, a new adventure. Who's gonna be here? What are we gonna be seeing? So it looks like the sickest patient this morning is gonna be a patient who is having a heart attack. Um, you know, I'm gonna spend less time on the computer. Let's actually go see this patient right now. He's still in the emergency department. Okay, so I just reviewed the patient's chart and everything that happened when he came in last night. Basically, the troponin level in his blood is elevated. So that means that the heart is under strain, it's under stress. And his ECG looks abnormal, probably a blocked artery. So this looks like a heart attack. So he's been started on a whole bunch of different medications to try to help the heart. And now we're waiting for an angiogram when they actually go and look in the coronary arteries of the heart and see if there is a blockage. So I just heard from the nurses that the patient is being transferred up to the cath lab. So I wonder if we can actually go up there, watch Dr. Bakar do the angiogram, find out if there's a blockage in his coronary arteries and whether they can fix it. So this is the cardiac cath lab. It's where heart attacks get treated, where cardioversions are done, and it's also where they insert pacemakers. As the patient is being transferred upstairs from the emergency department, the nurses prepare for the procedure by taking out equipment and drawing up medications. Just like in an operating room, the equipment is sterile, so you can't touch anything on these tables covered in blue cloths, unless you're wearing sterile gloves. It's every medical student's nightmare to mess this up and get in trouble. Now this is a specialized x-ray machine, and when the procedure starts, you'll see how it's used to actually visualize the coronary arteries in real time. Obviously, working beside an x-ray machine can be problematic, so the team wears these dosimeters to track the amount of radiation they're exposed to, and they wear one of these lead aprons which weighs about 10 pounds. It may not seem like a lot, but it adds up when you're wearing it all day. You don't like to wear the, the fiery side out? Keeps the fire inside, okay. That was a surprise when we ordered him his lead. Yeah, we put the inside. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't just gonna give him plain gray. All right, I'm suited in my cool lead suit. This one protects my thyroid because you're in there with x-rays, so you've gotta keep yourself safe. All right, let's go. So now we're ready to start. First, the nurse gives the patient a medication to help him relax, but he'll still remain awake for the procedure. Next, after freezing the patient's skin, Dr. Bakar inserts a catheter, which is a thin, hollow tube, into the patient's radial artery in the wrist. This is the most common place to insert the catheter these days, but it's also possible to use the femoral artery in the groin if needed. Then contrast dye is injected into the artery. Without it, you can't see arteries on the x-ray, but when the artery is filled with the dye, it shows up looking like this. And just like that, we found the blockage. The right coronary artery should be wrapping around the heart, providing oxygen to the heart muscle, but it's completely blocked right here. Okay, now Dr. Bacard gently pushes the guide wire through the blockage and uses a balloon to break up the plaque. Just by doing that, there's now blood flowing through the artery again, but it won't stay open on its own, so he needs to insert a metal stent to hold it open. But first, we get to use the intravascular ultrasound. This technology is so cool. It's definitely the tiniest ultrasound I've ever seen. So small that it can go inside the artery to measure the diameter to help Dr. Bakar choose the right stent. This is what a coronary artery stent looks like. It's a mesh made out of metal that's placed on top of a balloon. When the balloon gets inflated, the stent gets pushed open against the wall of the artery. I just can't get over how tiny this stent is. It really gives you a sense how small our coronary arteries are. So that's what's happening inside the patient's artery right now. Dr. Bakar is placing stents into the artery to hold it open. And there's so much disease that he actually has to place three overlapping stents. Again, the intravascular ultrasound comes in handy. See the green circle? This is the wall of the artery and the small white circle is the stent. So Dr. Bakar knows the stent can be dilated open a bit more to widen the artery as much as possible and get even more blood flow to the heart. Voila! Look at this before and after. Such a beautiful sight. And check this out. As contrast dye is injected into the left ventricle, you can actually see the heart pumping. Amazingly, the heart is pumping really well and it doesn't look like there's been any permanent damage to the muscle itself. 
which is great news. You may be surprised to hear that, since there was a complete blockage of the artery. Well, that's because the blockage happened slowly over time, and the heart was able to adapt by creating collateral blood vessels. These are tiny blood vessels coming from the left side of the heart to deliver blood and oxygen to the right side of the heart that's affected by the blockage. And interestingly, we don't know if people are born with these extra little blood vessels or if they grow and develop when the need arises. Pretty cool, eh? And that's it. Well, not quite. <laughs> like everything in medicine, you finish with paperwork. In this case, Dr. Bakar is using this diagram of the heart to indicate the location and severity of each blockage and then where he placed the stents. No matter how many times I watch an angiogram, I still find it so cool, especially when you're actually treating the patient and can talk to them about their arteries, about their heart, because you've been right there and seen it. Plus, I've never seen an intravascular ultrasound used before, so that was a first. So I'm sure that many of you have heard that in the case of heart attack, you need to rush patients to treatment, you need to treat them right away, like you can't wait. So we look at many things, but one of the big ones is the ST segment in the ECG. Now this gets technical, but basically if this part of the ECG is elevated in the right areas and it makes sense, um, then this is called a STEMI. This is the emergency where we basically say door to balloon in 90 minutes. You see your first healthcare professional, we want you in the cath lab, getting that balloon in there, opening up the artery, and regaining blood flow to the heart. And the idea is that time is myocardium, time is muscle. You need to save the heart and that's why you need to open up that blood vessel so quickly. So that type of classic heart attack that you think of is usually caused by a sudden blockage of an artery. Whereas our patient had a chronic total occlusion. So over time, that artery was slowly narrowing and narrowing and narrowing, but it gave the, t the heart time to adapt. So it actually developed some extra blood vessels to supply blood to the heart. And then when it finally closed up, this is when all these symptoms started getting a lot worse. It also means that we have a little bit more time to open up that blood vessel compared to when the blockage happens all of a sudden and the heart doesn't have any time to adapt. But at the end of the day, when you're at home and you or a loved one has chest pain, you don't know what kind of heart attack it is. So either way, you need to get to the hospital, call an ambulance as quickly as possible. Next, I'm getting the rest of the medical team involved. Jill, the dietitian, will go over his diet, and Amy, our pharmacist, will go over the many new medications he's starting. So one thing that you may not think about when it comes to a heart attack is that patients have driving restrictions when they leave the hospital. Um, it kind of depends how severe the heart attack is and how it was treated um, to determine how long you can't drive. But this can be a huge stress for patients, um, especially our patient who is a commercial truck driver. So he drives for a living. So I've got to say, I'm really not looking forward to that conversation because I think it's gonna be tough for him. But there's a good reason for it. After having a heart attack, you know, the heart can be damaged. You can have an arrhythmia, a new arrhythmia, a new dangerous rhythm that could cause someone to faint or pass out at the wheel, which is obviously very dangerous. You can get low blood pressure. You can have nerve problems. Like things can happen in the weeks after a heart attack. So we'll know after we get the echocardiogram back, the ultrasound of the heart to see how his heart is pumping. Worst case scenario, if there's damage and the walls of the heart aren't moving properly, he may not be able to drive his truck at work for up to three months. All right, so that was just one of 12 patients that I saw today, but I really enjoyed going more in depth on one case. Let me know what you think. And what else do you wanna learn about? Let me know and I'll try to incorporate it into some future videos. Be sure to subscribe and that way, I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now.